Uh, my name is Mark Rambo, and I'll be presenting today Life and Death in Old Scoop Town, Sturgis Main Street, 1878 to 1888. Um, oh, most of you know I'm a local resident, grew up here. Uh, so I'm a historian, as most of you had him as a teacher, I'm sure, at some point. Um, studied history myself in college, and I'm glad to be part of the Historical Society. I've been the president now since, well, I guess since the Historical Society started about three years ago or so. Um, and we're glad you guys are here and, and participating in our activities. Um, early on, we were had a little meeting about the Historical Society, and we got together afterward for some coffee. And uh, Jan and Ross were sitting down with my dad and I. We were talking about early Sturgis, throwing around ideas and questions. And um, I had been doing some research in old newspapers and finding lots of reports in the Deadwood papers about such and such a thing had occurred on Main Street Sturgis, and this shooting and this killing and that sort of thing on Main Street Sturgis. And uh, so I asked the question at the time, you know, we had always been led to believe that all the bad stuff that happened in the community was always in that, that dark canyon area between Sturgis and Fort Meade. You know, there was this area in there where all the bad stuff occurred. And that was always the story I had heard. And uh, so I decided I was going to dig a little deeper and find out, you know, whether this, this occurrence of crime and violence and stuff on our main street was true. And as I started digging, I found out a lot more than I ever thought I would. Um, at the time, when you, you look at newspaper references from the time, um, Sturgis in the Deadwood Papers is referred to as the hardest town in America, and at another time, the wickedest town in the West. And knowing the reputation of Deadwood, you have to wonder how bad did it have to be here, you know, for Deadwood to think of us in that fashion. <laughs> so, um, that, that kind of led me to, you know, continue to dig, continue to dig, and my, my sources have been uh, the newspapers of the Times, primarily. I've read a few other books and things, but the newspapers have been the best source for me to find um, all the stories and everything. Um, at the time, the newspapers, they were the only conduit of news. There was no other way of sharing news. Mouth to mouth or a newspaper, that was it. And uh, newspapers wanted to fill space and they filled space by print, reprinting stories from other communities. And they would always find the most lurid uh, stories to reprint. So there are a few times in here, and you'll see a, in some of the slides, where an occurrence would occur here in Sturgis, be reported in the Deadwood paper, and then be reprinted all over the nation. And because of it, Sturgis and its uh, nickname of Scoop Town became synonymous with wild, desperate, crazy times and, and, and desperate measures being taken and all kinds of stuff like that. And you'll, you'll get a little bit more sense of that as we go along. The other thing, though, that the papers did was uh, would always tell us that something happened in a Sturgis saloon or in a dance hall on Main Street or at Abe Hill's place, but they never actually told you where those were located. And so a part of this journey I've been on is to try to identify the specific locations on Main Street. And I haven't been able to do it in every case. There's a couple of times I've been able to come up with a spot, and I'll throw some speculation at it as to where things might have occurred. Uh, but that's, that's still a work in progress, trying to find the exact spots on Main Street. So we're going to be limiting ourselves to Main Street, activities that had something to do with Main Street, primarily those first two blocks of Main Street between Junction and really up to almost 3rd Street over there. Um, will be just that first little stretch. That was where all the activity we're going to discuss occurred. Okay? So, like I said, there wasn't really any sense of, um, you know, there's no street addresses or anything like that. So we're not sure where everything was located. This is really the first reference that I've been able to come up with that shows a specific uh, location for certain businesses. Most of them aren't named, and there's a few of them. The Scholar House is actually listed on there. If, you, if I were to you know, give you a better image of it, you'd be able to see that. Um, this is the 1885 Sanborn Fire Map. The Sanborn Company would put out these maps for various communities and sell them to insurance companies so that they could insure businesses without going and inspecting them. And they would have um, all kinds of different types of 
indicators on the buildings that showed what the building's made out of. You'll see lots of things like here, here, up here. Those are all wells. So if they're, they're indicating where the wells are, what buildings are near water, what buildings are constructed out of stone or brick, and which ones are uh, wood, that sort of thing. And then the insurance companies could um, appropriately uh, gauge their, their uh, potential loss in, in, in case of a fire. Um, the other source then, as I said, uh, is the press of the time. And the Deadwood Press was notoriously hard on the town of Sturgis. Sturgis City, as it was called at the time. Uh, they did not like us. We had planted ourselves between what they saw as their rightful business um, at Fort Meade and with the soldiers. They wanted them coming to Deadwood to, to uh, spend their money and relieve them of their pay. Uh, the other thing is they didn't like that Sturgis, from the time it was founded, started lobbying to break away from Lawrence County, which we were part of at that time, and began trying to form our own county, which ultimately became Meade County many years later. And uh, for a variety of other reasons, they did not like us. They were our only source of news for the first five years of this journey we're on, from 1878 to 1883, when the Sturgis record began to publish in the summer of 1883. So a lot of the stories we get are darkened a bit by the Deadwood attitude toward our community. And from 1883 on, the version we get from the Sturgis paper is usually whitewashed quite a bit. So you gotta kind of read both versions and, and try to pick some middle ground as to what actually may have occurred. All right, so why did, was Sturgis here? Well, this is the natural spot to enter the Black Hills from, for the northern air, hills area of Deadwood, all the mining camps. This is where the Bismarck Trail came in from the north. This is where the Fort Pier Trail came in from the east, and the Sydney Trail came in from the west. They all converged in this very spot right at the head of Main Street. And that's where they would head to Deadwood, and uh, hauling things in by, wagon, by uh, mule train, was the only way we could get anything in here until 1887 when the railroad arrived. So this was a very busy place, very busy. And it would have had a whole different character than you would have ever, ever expected to see today. I'm kind of going through this beginning part because this is where I lost a lot of time this morning. So I'm kind of zipping through it, but we'll answer questions later. Um, of course, it was all predicated on the military coming here in the summer of 1878. First, the 1st Infantry arrived and set up Camp Bear Butte, right next to Bear Butte on the west side. And then the 7th Cavalry arrived a couple of weeks later and set up Camp J.G. Sturgis right alongside of Camp Bear Butte. Um, we all know the, the story. Scoop Town was formed right next door on, on uh, Grasshopper Jim's property. It was primarily um, businessmen from Deadwood that would bring up uh, uh, portable, you know, tents and set up uh, temporary bars, dance halls, casinos, um, brothels, that sort of thing. Um, the misnomer of it is, though, that it wasn't just drinking and prostitution. A lot of the ways they relieved the soldiers of their pay was selling them things they needed. There were people that would make a lot of money selling coats and socks and and uh, that kind of stuff as well. So. It wasn't always a, a dark and horrible place. It was, it was uh, probably mostly a dark and horrible place. Um, but Scoop Town uh, became kind of synonymous with, with, the, uh, with the scooping of the soldiers. And the term scoop, of course, is most common today in journalism when you get the scoop on another paper. It really doesn't mean that you're doing anything nefarious in and of itself. You're just taking advantage of, some, of an opportunity and you're beating somebody else to the punch is kind of what the, the term refers to. It used to be a very common term. I find it in the newspapers used a lot for sporting events, baseball games, that so-and-so scoop so-and-so and that kind of thing. And it was a very common term at the time. So, um, like I said too, that at the time, we were part of Lawrence County and you can see that Lawrence County comes all the way out to the end of what is now Meade County. And the effort was there from the very beginning to try to break away. And, and Lawrence County, because of that, the official 
uh, Lawrence County structure in Deadwood did not appreciate our community at all and went out of their way at all times to uh, give us a dark name and, and really turned the t name Scoop Town when it started being applied to our community as well into a, a, a bad word. It's kind of like, you know, like some people say redneck and mean, you know, a horrible thing, but other people embrace it and say, oh yeah, that's us. Well, and eventually Sturgis began to embrace the name. Uh, but why did Sturgis carry such a re tough reputation? You know, was it justified? Um, of course, this is Main Street, looking west. <clears throat> At the time, you would have had a variety of different businesses, but about half of them would have been saloons and dance halls. Um, the Deadwood Paper, of course, in 1878, the fall of 1878, reported that every building in Sturgis is a saloon, which obviously can't be true because we know there were a lot of other businesses and homes and things like that, but they reported that every business was a saloon. I did count on the 1885 map that we had up there earlier, and I counted 15 saloons in that two block area. And that was in 1885 after the business community had really developed a lot more. So, you know, we would have, we would have had a lot of mule trains coming up Main Street. We would have had a lot of soldiers riding around on horseback. There were several blacksmith shops, so we would have had the ring of the anvil all day. And at night, the sounds would have changed a little bit because you'd have cowboys and soldiers who were known to frequently race horses up and down the street, uh, with people shooting out windows, street lights, and a lot of neat stuff like that. So a lot of gunfire, a lot of uh, yelling, music drifting out of the saloons and the dance halls and, and uh, you name it. So Sturgis in some ways deserved its reputation in that, in that respect. Oops, wrong button, sorry. This is more what it would have looked like at the time. Of course, this says it's 1886 on the bottom, but I think it's probably more like 1885 or earlier because the bank building's not there yet. The brick bank building's not on the corner yet, and that was built in 1886. Uh, so, unless it's right at the beginning of the year. So, anyway, that, that gives you a sense of what Sturgis would have looked like. Um, as far as the violence and things that the other communities would um, accuse Sturgis of, we were founded, um, well, I'm just going to jump over that. We were founded, of course, in August of 1878. First businesses opened in September, but by October 28th, the first murder occurred. The Deadwood Papers loved it. They were jubilant. The first murder at Sturgis City committed by Baldy Ford, a gentleman by the name of Ned Buntline, nicknamed Baldy Ford. He was a noted gambler and, uh, and really a rough citizen. He had been arrested many times in Deadwood for a variety of different offenses, uh, brandishing knives at people. He shot a gentleman named Tendai Brown. He uh, beat somebody with the butt of a gun. He had done a lot of nasty things, but he also was said to be a very nice guy when he was sober, and everybody loved him. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't sober very frequently, so he had a bad reputation. He walked into a bar in Sturgis and announced that he was the best man in the house, and another gentleman started standing up to take offense to that comment. And he turned around and put five bullets through him. Three of them went right through him and into the, the bar. And uh, he dropped dead on the spot. And his, his confederates up in Deadwood, Baldy Ford's confederates, uh, the people in the gambling fraternity around the Black Hills, uh, said, oh yeah, Baldy's been looking for somebody to kill for a long time. Um, of course, they chalked it up. Well, he was drunk at the time, so you can't really hold him responsible. But we all know how that, that works in the legal circles. Um, he was said to have uh, gotten $400 donated by the, his, legal, his friends in Deadwood and bought a very fine legal team to uh, defend him. But he was found guilty of uh, manslaughter and sentenced to 15 years in the uh, House of Corrections in Detroit. At that point, South Dakota still didn't have a penitentiary. We would send all of our prisoners to Detroit under contract, and 
It was in the spring of 1883 that we built the Correction House, and the, the Correction's House is Sioux Falls opened up. And we will be talking about that and Mr. Baldy Ford again a little bit later. Um, but this is the suspected spot of the first murder in Sturgis. Yes, sir? You said something about Ned Buntline. That was his actual name, Ned Buntline Ford. Uh, the guy Ned Buntline was the gentleman who basically invented the dime novel. Yeah. I don't know if there's a connection or not, but his name was Ned Buntline Ford. Nice. N.B. Ford. The Buntline special was the cold pistol. The cold pistol that he was said to have made and presented. Yeah. Yeah. Same name. That's really interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, John Scollard, who later, <coughs> who was at this very time building the Sheridan House Hotel, which we'll talk about again, uh, had built a temporary building in this same location. This was, building wasn't there yet at this time. And according to Annie Talent, he opened a business in this location, a temporary boarding house and saloon, until his other one was built. And he opened it in September of 1878, and his bar was called The Fountain. And this is where uh, Baldy Ford took offense to John Russell standing up in the room, apparently, and killed him. Building still standing? Yeah, that's the J.C. Penney building yeah, yeah. downtown. Mm -hmm. That's not the same building though. There was another building there that just replaced it another time. There actually was another building in between too, because this is the uh, uh, benevolent hall, and there was a different benevolent hall before this one that burned down. So, um, the next stop on our journey is where the current bank building stands in. Late 1878 or early 1879, there was a wood frame building here with the big Bonanza uh, saloon in it. And this is where uh, the second murder in Sturgis occurred in January of 1879. The, uh, Fort, the soldiers at Fort Meade were frequently deserting. Matter of fact, in 1886, uh, there was a story in the Sturgis paper in November that said, so far this year, 26 people have deserted from the 7th Cavalry. And that was many years later. You know, I mean, at this point in time, there wasn't a lot for soldiers to do. A lot of them had been coerced to join the military, stay out of jail, that kind of thing. So they, uh, they would frequently take off. And in January, they did, <clears throat> five members. Two of them headed to lead and were later caught there. Two of them headed off down the Sydney Road and disappeared and were never caught. But one of them, James Hanlon, uh, decided to hide in plain sight, so to speak. He stayed in Sturgis. He went to his favorite <coughs> dance hall, the Big Bonanza. And uh, when Lieutenant Starr and his troops from the 7th Cavalry came through looking for him, they decided to check you know, all the usual places and were looking at all the clubs and the, the dance halls. And they did check the Big Bonanza and he wasn't in sight, so they moved on. It was said he was hiding under the skirts of his favorite girl, Scarface Charlie. And he and Scarface Charlie then began to dance after they left. Well, they circled around and came back, and they found him in plain sight. Private Hanlon decided he was going to try to run for it, and Lieutenant Starr fired a warning shot, uh, hit him in the kidney, and killed him on the spot. So he was buried out at the National Cemetery at Fort Meade. Okay, and then in March, just a month or so later, two months later, um, another murder occurred in Sturgis. We don't know where this one was. There, it just said in a, a saloon. Um, but the gentleman that was killed was, he's referred to as a black fiddler named Charles Williams, a colored fiddler named Charles Williams. And the gentleman who was said to have killed him was Fighting Dan. And they only identify him as Fighting Dan. Nobody knows for sure who Fighting Dan is. And they even say in the article here that they think it might be a guy named Dan Trippy. And he's the fellow who shot Trix in the face about a year ago. Trix being a prostitute in Deadwood. I did find the article about it in a previous newspaper. But Dan Trim Trimpy then came forward and said, no, that's not me, I'm not fighting Dan. That's a guy named Dan Nealis. Well, they later found uh, all kinds of stories that are, everybody's trying to find this Dan Nealis, this fighting Dan. And there's a weird comment in one of the Deadwood papers that he's hiding in the caves near Fort Meade, that he was thought to be hiding in the caves. I don't know what caves those were. If anybody has any thoughts on that, tell me after. Um, but then a couple weeks later, it was said that he was seen 
on the Sydney Trail heading south of the Black Hills and getting out of the area. So, oh, by the way, uh, uh, Charles Williams was taken to Deadwood for the coroner's inquest and was buried in Potter's Field in Mount Moriah. Find where I am here. I'm just talking. I'm not paying attention. Okay. I'm going to make another stop on Main Street. I had mentioned John Scholar building a temporary structure while his hotel was going up. And this is the Sheridan House Hotel right here. And it's about where Big L Swap Shot is now, roughly. Um, you know, right next to Tom's Tees. And you can see it's a, it's, it's a pretty nice facility. John Scholar was one of the leading citizens of the town, one of the founders of the community. He had, uh, he was later on the city council and he was the mayor. He was the guy who, when the deputy sheriff needed a posse or somebody to go out and help him round somebody up, he'd take John Scholar along. He was that guy. He was kind of the one of those community stalwarts who, you know, a community is built around. Um, it was odd that in March of 1880, when uh, John Scholar was arrested and charged with assault with intent to kill, apparently there were four or five soldiers from the 7th Cavalry at his establishment drinking playing cards, and they said that he was intentionally drugging them and trying to uh, get them to knock, knock them out by drugging them in their drinks so that he could rob them. And he took offense to that and uh, pummeled several members of it. It later came out, and the charges were dropped, it came out that these gentlemen were the aggressors. They actually went after him and were trying to force him to give him free drinks and stuff. And he wouldn't back down, and he did come up in the bar and pummel several members by himself uh, with the butt of a gun. So uh, the gun did discharge during it, creased the scalp of one of the gentlemen, and he bled a lot. They thought he was going to die, but it was just totally a superficial injury, and he survived. Uh, charges were dropped. Now, a couple of the gentlemen, uh, brothers Mike and Tom Pendergrass, reoccur constantly in the Deadwood paper you know, for all kinds of crazy stuff they, they're doing. Uh, they were members of the 7th Cavalry and got court-martialed a couple times and finally groaned out of the military out here. Uh, but, you know, the charges were dropped. Um, the, the one weird circumstance of this story is that um, after it occurred, the citizens in Deadwood one night looked out north and they saw a glowing sky and they all thought that the 7th Cavalry had let Sturgis City on fire in retaliation for John Scholar shooting this gentleman and beating these other soldiers. And they didn't stop to think that Sturgis isn't north of Deadwood, it's east. And those were the northern lights that they were looking at. So it, uh, that came out in the paper later. All right, our next stop, and we're not sure again, see it's in front of Froon's Saloon is where it was, but we're not sure where Froon's Saloon is. And again, if anybody has any old references in the town, I'd love to see them. But, um, it was October 25th, 1880. It had been a really, really active couple of days in town. Um, there was an election coming up late October. You know, you have your election early November, and a lot of city and county officers were being elected. Um, the Democratic caucus had been held the day before, and they had nominated their person for city constable and that sort of thing. And then on this particular day, the Republican caucus was held, and they did the same thing. They nominated their candidates. Um, there was also payday for the soldiers, so they were up and down Main Street, and it was a pretty wild place at the time. Um, it was during this that uh, there was a lot of gun play occurring up and down the street, and Judge Ash, uh, who was the Justice of Peace, went into uh, Miller's saloon and found George Heber who was the deputy sheriff, and he uh, was asked to go out and find out what was going on and who's firing those guns and quell the problems. Now, George Heber has, is one of those characters that real big guy, had lived by, lived by might through his whole life. He beat down a lot of people. He was not necessarily on the right side of the law. He just happened to be the guy wearing the badge. Um, he came down the street. He was looking for who might have been firing his guns. And as he was coming down the street, he was down near, near uh, Harmon's uh, Hardware, which would be the uh, 
Well, it's where Gallery 21 used to sit. Harmon's uh, store was the first business built in Sturgis. And we were back here a few slides. You'd see it. I kind of skipped over that because I'm trying to go fast. This is, they would have been in this area somewhere. And uh, he saw a gentleman, Sylvester Merritt, who, as it turns out, was trying to help a buddy of his who had gotten inebriated. He was trying to help his friend uh, by the name of, and I'm sorry, Adam Mitchell, a gentleman from, they were both from Pleasant Valley. Um, Sylvester Merritt was trying to help him on his horse, and had just finally gotten him on the horse, and was trying to turn the horse and lead him when George Heber came up, and he thought they were causing a ruckus, so he came over, knocked Sylvester Merritt down, and grabbed the other gentleman up and threw him off the horse and said, I'm taking you guys in, you're causing trouble. Well, Sylvester Merritt immediately started to protest and say, you know, you've got the wrong guys, I'm trying to help my friend. And George Heber wasn't going to have any of it. He immediately started drawing his pistol and Sylvester Merritt instinctively went for his own, pulled it and fired and shot George Heber in the head instantly and dropped him dead right on the street. Um, he ran over to his boss's business, who his boss was sleeping in the back, Mr. Harmon, gave him his gun and said, I killed Dutch George. I got to get out of here. And headed to, he told him, I'm going to my dad's uh, hay ranch out on Elk Creek. So he headed out there. And uh, the law, of course, wanted to find him and speak to him. And his dad convinced him to go up to Deadwood and, and uh, talk to the authorities. So he did, he was found that um, it was self-defense and that they were not gonna press charges. Well, some friends of George Heber didn't like that, so they pressed some other uh, law officials that they needed to press charges, which they did. Um, Sylvester Merritt was found not guilty, um, again, for self-defense, and then they pressed charges again. And this time, Sylvester Merritt decided he wasn't gonna stick around and wait this out. He lit out and he disappeared. His family was still in the area, but he was not heard from again. The next thing that we should probably cover is the arrival of the 25th Infantry. In the summer of 1880, the Buffalo Soldiers of the 25th Infantry arrived at Fort Meade. Uh, they ended up being here about seven years and had a pretty peaceful tenure for the whole first four years or so of that. Uh, it was later that things kind of went wrong for them in the community. But the Buffalo Soldiers arrived, and the Deadwood paper uh, trumpeted that Sturgis had hit a jackpot because there's doubling the number of soldiers coming in, and there's going to be all kinds of new business and more pay coming in. At this point in time, the monthly pay for the soldiers of Fort Meade was about $20,000 was the payroll out there. And that was a lot of money, and almost all of it was gone by the time payroll, payday rolled around again, or well before payday rolled around. So this, the community really was living large on the soldiers. Um, the thing that Sturgis was not ready for was to accommodate these soldiers in the same fashion they had with the 7th Cavalry soldiers. Um, one of the first groups to come into town, a gentleman went into a saloon in order to drink, and the white woman behind the bar pulled a gun and shot him in the leg for sitting down at her bar and ordering a drink. Um, so, there were some uh, businessmen that decided to capitalize on that, and they um, brought in dance girls and stuff from St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, those areas, and built a separate portion of Main Street that catered directly to the uh, 25th Infantry. And so subsequently, we ended up with a segregated Main Street for a period of time. You'll see between, oh, wrong button again, my apologies. Between 1st and 2nd Street here, so we're talking about the second block of Main Street. This side with the Sheridan House and everything had still uh, saloons and things that were strictly for white soldiers and white residents. But this side over here, and this is the 1885 map, uh, you'll see right here, Febro, female housing Negro. And there's a couple other spots on the map in different places where it says residence Negro, that kind of thing. So this side of the block ended up being the segregated portion of our town. Um, not something we're necessarily proud of today, but again, most people don't know about it, so we, we kind of move on with life and don't even think about it. Um, but again, you can see the different saloons that were here. 
several of them, uh, boarding houses, uh, which generally were pro could be considered brothels in some cases. Um, the other thing I notice is that there's also two bowling alleys, one right here, one right here, yeah. behind the, the different businesses. Uh, you don't picture that in 1885, but there were bowling teams traveling around between towns challenging each other at that period of time. Um, anyway, so we ended up with a segregated Main Street, and um, things, things went very well for a while. Um, winter of 1881, uh, Tom Miller's um, saloon came into question again. And, and again, we don't, aren't too sure where Tom Miller's saloon was, but a couple members of the 7th Cavalry, both members of Company H, wandered in. They had already, were already drunk from, uh, from drinking post-trader's whiskey out of the fort. And they came in, Deputy Sheriff Schnell, Justice Schnell was in there, and they asked him to join them and have a, have a drink. They bought him a couple of drinks. He was happy to oblige. And uh, as they were talking, Elijah Strode um, got in an argument with the other gentleman by the name of Waylon, who um, Elijah Strode had apparently shot another soldier named King out at Fort Meade recently. And he, Waylon knew that it was him, and he felt Waylon was going to report this to the authorities. So he was trying to convince him not to report it, not to snitch on it. And uh, Waylon was having none of it. He was just telling him, I'll do what I want to. And Elijah Strode stood up and pulled a gun and told him he's, he better listen to him and better do as, he told, as he's told. Well, Deputy Sheriff Schnell got up and went over, and he was talking to Strode at the time and was trying to calm him down. He didn't think it was a real serious affair. Meantime, Waylon got up and went behind the bar and located a gun and came back out. And when Strode saw that he had armed himself, he put his gun away and said, fine, you want to shoot me? Go ahead. Well, it's kind of in the cartoons where the words are still in the balloon above his head. The bullet slammed into him right as he was finishing the sentence. And he dropped dead right there on the spot. And. Uh, Justice Schnell immediately apprehended Waylon, but when he turned to try to get help for, uh, to see if uh, Strode could be helped, um, Waylon departed the building <laughs> on his own accord. And uh, he took off running down the street. Well, he was captured pretty quickly within a couple of buildings by John Scollard and Judge Ash and several other people that had come running and could see that something was going on and heard the shot. So he was brought back in. Um, there were threats of lynching. He hadn't. He was not lynched. He was taken to Deadwood and he was tried. Um, he was found not guilty, and because he uh, had acted in self-defense is what they were determined. Uh, Strode was buried at the Post Cemetery. Waylon, by the way, is not a was not necessarily an angel himself. It said that he had a scar on his neck from an attempted lynching years earlier when he uh, had done something untoward himself, and <clears throat> they had attempted to string him up. But Strode is buried out at the, whoops, I went one too far tonight. Strode's buried out at uh, Bear Butte Cemetery as well. Uh, one of the yeah. offshoots of this is that um, the Deadwood media started really catching a drift of what was going on in Sturgis. By this time, it had become known as Scoop Town. The first few months it wasn't, but after Scoop Town quit existing, the, the followers of that camp came into, into Sturgis City and, and brought the reputation and name with them. And they started looking for any opportunity now to really, really defame the community. Um, after, during this case, reporting on this case, the Deadwood Enterprise stated, Sturgis City, that hellhole of inequity, the abode of murderers and thieves, has once more come to the front with a murder case. And the evening press reported, this occurrence will not add to the popularity of Sturgis City as a summer resort, nor to the reputation of its general run of inhabitants for peace and quietude. <clears throat> well, ironically, the Black Hills Daily Times, the Deadwood paper, other Deadwood paper, there were two the Times and the Pioneer were the two big ones. And they usually went after Sturgis pretty hard, especially the Times. But the Times actually came out and blamed it on the disreputable people of Sturgis that are trained there are no disreputable people of Sturgis. There are transients that go there from here, Leeds, Central, and other portions of the country. 
also including the soldiers of the post, and it is these people who have made most of the trouble that has occurred there. The commander of the post is responsible indirectly for the most of the inequity that has troubled them. It would be an easy matter for him to prevent these disreputable soldiers from going off the reservation every night of their lives when they felt like it. So you basically blame it on General Sturgis at this point. And, uh, and if there's an odd correlation, General Sturgis did leave as commander a couple of times and then come back. And there's, I, I need to track it. I need to find out exactly when he was here because there is an odd spike in occurrence of trouble with the soldiers from the fort when he's the commanding officer out there, as opposed to Major Lazelle or one of the others. So we are now in front of Sturgis Pond building. I don't know if that's still there or not. You know how Main Street changes frequently. I took this picture about two years ago. Um, it would have been about the middle of the block over here. And uh, this was a place called the Enterprise Club. And it had been sold it was in the process of being sold in 1883. A gentleman arrived in town um, by the name of Ned Buntline Ford. You probably remember Ned Buntline Ford, Baldy Ford. He was committed the first murder in Sturgis and had gone away for 15 years in the penitentiary. But uh, he, was, he was part of his friends in Deadwood didn't forget him. They put on a big effort, writing letters constantly and Money flowed pretty freely, and they finally got Governor Ordway to pardon him in 1883. Governor Ordway, a few months later, was uh, removed from office and charged with uh, graft for taking bribes. And one of them, as a matter of fact, was to move the state, the territorial capital from Yankton to Bismarck. He was the gentleman that took bribes in order to allow that to happen. And there was talk that he had taken bribes for some uh, pardons and things as well. So, but anyway. Baldy Ford headed back to the Black Hills and was met in Deadwood with a parade and a band, uh, but didn't want to stay in Deadwood. He wanted to come settle in Sturgis City. So he purchased this saloon. It's across the street from the Sheridan House. Uh, he was actually pretty good friends with John Scholar. Uh, like we said before, when he was sober, he was a very well-liked gentleman and had a lot of very important friends and, and people that stood up for him. He opened... Um, the Enterprise Club, but his luck didn't hold out. Of course, he had dried out pretty good while he was in Detroit, and he was no longer uh, in the same confines there as he was there, and he started drinking again, and it was just a matter of time. Within a couple months, the uh, Deadwood paper reported that uh, Baldy Ford's on his war horse again and tearing up Sturgis, and he was shooting up the streets, and he was threatening people with weapons and that sort of thing again, to the point where Within a few months, his partners in, the, in his business venture decided they were going to pull their funding from him. And they wanted to get all their properties back and eject him from the, from the building. And uh, they sent an attorney, Mike May, uh, McMahon, and he pistol whipped him pretty severely. He, he was hospital, he needed a lot of medical attention, hospitalized for a little while. Who did? Baldy Ford did. Yeah. He, beat he beat him with a butt of a pistol, yeah. And, uh, was of course charged with that then and sent to Deadwood um, with that and with stealing some property that some things that had disappeared from that his partners had given to the business. Um, he was found not guilty in Deadwood because you know you can't be guilty of something if you're drunk when you do it. You know, that's kind of their their attitude at the time. Um, so he was found not guilty, but he he st continued to have legal problems and he had another uh, assault with a deadly weapon charge that was following him and he decided in April of 1884 that it just wasn't worth it. He bought, boarded a stage and headed to Montana and Idaho to go to the mining camps in that area and swore he'd never come back. So we'll get back to Baldy Ford again. <laughs> just <a little> bit. <laughs> um, right, next is the Keystone Restaurant, which would have been around where Weiner's Bakery is now. Um, of course, you could probably see right here at Keystone Restaurant. And uh, one morning in, uh, I'm trying to see the exact date. Sorry, April of 1884, uh, the body of Mr. W.N. Stafford was found 
on the, there was a little step stepping up right here. And it was found on the step right in front of the Keystone restaurant, which happened to be right next door. You'll see the empty lot there. That was Abe Hill's saloon, Abe Hill's uh, Go As You Please Club. And he was, his body was found. He was just breathing his last breath when somebody arrived, but they were unable to save him. It was later reported that they, he had been seen arguing with three members of the 25th Infantry out front there, and that one of them had struck him. And uh, they did identify who those members were and uh, brought them in for questioning. Um, there was a gentleman named Chambers who was charged with actually being the one that struck him. But as the coroner did their, his, uh, his search of the body and, and everything, or what you call it, um, autopsy, thank you. I just couldn't think that word for some reason. <laughs> when the coroner was doing his autopsy, um, he, uh, he found that Mr. Stafford had uh, at very advanced stages of cancer and was about 100 pounds. And he probably, when he was struck, it, they weren't sure if it was the hit that killed him or the fall, so to speak. Um, nowadays, the would be considered the same. But in those days, they let the suspects go because they felt, well, they didn't know he had cancer. And they weren't responsible for it. So the three gentlemen from the 25th Infantry were let, were let off the hook, but Stafford was a pretty popular man in town. Uh, several people, who, including uh, Baldy Ford, a lot of the more prominent people in town, uh, John Scollard and Judge Ash, and everybody were all the pallbearers at his funeral. Um, and then this was about the same time Baldy cut out of town. But um, the this, this city of Sturgis at the time was left with a lingering sense that there was something wrong with the legal system and that people were getting off of things and that there was a lot of violence beginning to occur. We had had a big uh, boom in 1883 that had occurred. Um, lots of people moving into the area, lots of farmers taking up farms and ranches out in the country. Um, they had said that the hillsides around town were covered with tents of families waiting for places to live. But it also said that there were a lot of desperate individuals living up in the hills around town as well. Um, there's several other cases that, of violence that occurred during that time that don't affect Main Street, so I'm not going to go into them. But it was said that there were a lot of really desperate people. And if you were here earlier for Wayne Gilbert's presentation, that was the period of time when several people were warned out of town. They were told by a vigilante committee, the Sturgis uh, Cit Citizen Safety Committee, um, posted the ominous 3777 which was a, a sign to uh, near do wells in Montana originally, is where it originated. And it was a warning to them that they had three days. I can't remember the number. The numbers are, it's gotten blurred in history as to something like to the effect of you have three days and $7 to get at least 77 miles away, something of that nature. So basically they're warning them. You get out of town or else. Well, none, nobody took them up on it, and uh, one of them probably should have. Um, Alex Fiddler was a real horrible character. Um, he had been in and out of jail, had been sent away to Detroit already. He kept coming back. He kept getting in more trouble. 1880 census, I found him in Deadwood. He was a resident of the jail. His occupation was listed as a jeweler that came from, but he, um, he was a bad fellow. About a year before this, he had been accused of a murder in Peter, and his, uh, a wealthy relative had paid off the witnesses and uh, got rid of all the witnesses, so he got out of that murder, he and a couple other people. So, um, again, we have this atmosphere already of, of the community that people are getting away with stuff they shouldn't be. They're starting to really be careful and conscious of what desperate characters in their community. When Alex Fiddler shows up, there was a gentleman by the name of Theodore Schramm. Um, he was an immigrant from Minnesota and eastern South Dakota. He was a German immigrant, had lived in that area. Um, he came into the area looking to relocate and had a wagon being pulled by a couple of mules he had purchased. When he got to Fort Meade, they recognized the mules and said those are government mules. 
and uh, we're going to take those back from you. And so they relieved him of his mules. He had no way of moving his wagon off of Fort Meade military reservation. So they took pity on him. Um, they moved him off just to this side of the reservation, just off the reservation lines and left him. Well, so he's probably in the area of the uh, soccer fields down here, maybe just a little bit further over about, you know, Tom's Tees or, you know, TNM Studio in that area. And uh, it says he's right next to Brewers, or Downers Brewery is where he was located. Apparently there was a brewery there as well. Um, when uh, he was attacked uh, by Fiddler and two Confederates, there, while he was on Fort Meade, he said, I can buy more mules. I have lots of money. Well, a couple of soldiers heard that, and they told their buddy, Alex Fiddler, and they joined in forces with him and, and robbed him. Alex Fiddler was in the, in the uh, process of beating him with his butt of his rifle, or of, of his pistol, trying to get an idea where the money was, when uh, the pistol went off and shot one of the, other, shot one of the soldiers in the arm. Um, they did get the money, they split it up and disappeared in, their, in separate directions, but the soldier that got shot in the arm was found. And uh, he spilled the beans. I mean, he just, he told everything he knew. And uh, the, big, the big person in this was Alex Fiddler. He was the one that was the mastermind. He was the one that did the beating. He's the one that made the threats, the whole thing. <clears throat> People already knew about him, obviously, in town. They had already threatened him and told him to get out of town. So he was captured. He was spreading his ill-gotten gains in an unidentified house of easy virtue on Main Street. Um, he was taken to the local calaboose. Now, a calaboose at that time was just a simple uh, lockup room. It was a reinforced walls, usually some kind of rebar shoved down through board, you know, thick, thick logs or something like that so that you couldn't get through it. And uh, Sturgis had a calaboose. Um, these are some images I got off the internet of just calabooses that still exist in different places. Um, but uh, the word calaboose was only really around in the 1870s and 1880s. After that, it got replaced by the term hooska, as some of you might recognize. So, uh, but our calaboose, again, returning back to the map we were looking at earlier, uh, you see 3rd Street in Maine, right here. It says 140 feet to a one-story frame calaboose. So if you, I did get out the little rolling thing, go out and measure it from Main Street over. And we're about right here, is where the calaboose would have been, right at the, where the Center for the Arts is, is currently located. Um, and that's where the calaboose was when they took Alex Fiddler. And that's where a group of 12 to 15 masked men showed up, probably business leaders in the community, but nobody knows for sure who they were. But 12 to, to 15 masked men entered the calaboose and under the point of the gun ordered the guards to release their prisoner to them. Uh, they took Fiddler to a sturdy tree just past the west edge of town, described as along Main Street and in the draw behind the Catholic Church. Wow, this is, okay, that's the reaction to this. All right, here's where we would end up. Main Street used to come down and curve, go under the railroad trestle, and then up over the hill to Deadwood. And this is right about where we would have found Alex Fiddler hanging on the tree. It was cut down in the 1920s to build Martin's uh, nursing house there. And that's, I believe, the same house that's currently there. Uh, but they said it was in that same vicinity of that house is where Fiddler's Tree was. Um, the community was out doing though. They, they really didn't have um, a lot of concern that Fiddler had been strung up. Um, he was reported in the paper that um, Sturgis Weekly Record speculated that he had fallen off a tree and become tangled in the rope, or that he was so embarrassed about his crime that he committed suicide. They speculated that he was trying to rob some eggs from a bird's nest and fell, getting tangled in the rope. <laughs> then they said his guards may have simply tied his rope too short. And then they also advised that it's best not to ask too many questions. So, nobody did. And nobody to this day knows who it was that strung up Alex Fiddler. But uh, the tree where he was, where it was hung became known as Fiddler's Tree. And in doing my research, I find in other newspapers around the country references to 
you know, so and so might need to find the fiddler's tree. So it kind of became synonymous with a hangman's tree in different parts of the country, which is kind of kind of an ominous uh, thing to be known for, I guess. But it's kind of neat. Okay. We next go to Eight Hills Go As You Please House. Um, again, this was a, a place where a gentleman, African American businessman, who was an excellent gambler and a great head for business, um, said to be a really nice fellow, but his house really was a go as you please club. You could do about whatever you wanted there. Um, it was also the site for many of the troubles that occurred in the community. And, and to attest to the popularity of this place, a lot of the bad things that happened there were often had witnesses of people that were judges, deputy sheriffs, that sort of thing. So they were, because they were all hanging out there, that was their favorite place to go. Uh, in October 1884, a member of the 25th Infantry, Ed Hines, he was one of the suspects in Mr. Stafford's death. He uh, came into the front of Abe Hill's place and was watching the dancing that was going on when he was told that he was wanted outside. So he went back out on the street, and I'm trying to remember the name here, sorry. Um, one of the dance hall girls was standing there waiting for him. Maud S. was her, her name, but her real name was Frances Wetterton. Maud S. was a famous trotting horse at the time. I Googled to find out who Maud S. might have been. And it was a trotting horse. It was like the champion trotting horse and uh, was super fast. So apparently it was a reference to her being fast. Um, he walked out and he saw her and she reached into the pocket of her skirt, pulled out a pistol, and shot him in the head and walked back into the dance hall and went back to work. And she danced for about a half hour before anybody showed up to try to arrest her. Um, he was uh, said to have roughed her up a few times and mistreated her pretty significantly and she just had had enough at that point. She was found not guilty uh, by, for self-defense and then was charged a second time and found not guilty by self-defense, by self-defense. and. Lived up to her name, they said, because she very quickly packed and cut out of town at that point. I've been tried twice already for the same crime. This would have been the location, right on the front of Abe Hill's place here. And Clinton Hines was buried, of course, out of Port Pete National Cemetery. All right. So this is um, current location of Sturgis Photo and Guess at the at this time, there would have been about four different businesses in there, from the uh, Fox and Stebbins Bank on the end to Dr. Lynch's uh, pharmacy at this end of the building right here. Uh, Dr. Lynch was a very popular uh, physician and, and druggist here in town. In August 1885, he was medically helping one of the dance hall girls named Mamie Long. She had had a run-in with one of her regular beaus, Corporal Ross Hallen who was a member of the 25th Infantry. Uh, Dr. L uh, Lynch was pressing her to press charges against him because he had broken several of her ribs and he had had to patch her up several times because of Helen. And so Helen got word of this. He felt the meddling doctor needed to be done away with. So one night, August 26, 1885, there was a little gap here between the buildings, a little alleyway you could walk through, just a walking space. And he walked in just inside of that area and saw Dr. Lynch reading a newspaper in his chair, and he fired through the window and shot him, killed him. Immediately took off running. He went around the back of the buildings across the street to another little alleyway and down the street. He had a lot of planning put into this. He had borrowed a tunic from another soldier, traded jackets with him, because um, the rank was different on the sleeve, so they wouldn't be recognized. He had stoned his own dog and told him to go with the other guy who was wearing his jacket, um, so that people would think that was him leaving town. And he, of course, the other guy flipped on him immediately and told him that he thought it was him. They went out, authorities went out and got him. Uh, Deputy Sheriff Souter went out and got him and brought him into town. They put him into the calaboose here in town while they were waiting. Um, okay, this is just another shot of Dr. Lynch's office would have been right here right here in these more contemporary photos. Um, they, they put him in the calaboose here in town in similar fashion as a year earlier, um, about 
12 to 15, masked man showed up and ordered the guards to release their prisoner to him. Now at that point, General Sturgis was back at Fort Meade and he was thinking, you know, I wonder if that might happen again. I better send some troops in to guard the, the uh, Calaboos. So he was sending a troop of the 7th Cavalry. Well, they got there right after this group had taken Corporal Allen and headed out with them. And they kind of had an idea where they were probably going. So they rode up Main Street, around the bend, and there was nobody to be found at uh, Fiddler Street. So they kept going a few more miles toward Deadwood, turned around, came back, and had been gone about 15, 20 minutes from their first pass through. And at that point, they found Corporal Allen hanging on Fiddler Street. Apparently, they had hidden when they heard the 7th Cavalry coming had hidden in the trees and waited till they left, and then strung him up. Again, the community was jubilant over the uh, hanging of Corporal Helen. Uh, there was still a lot of, of tension simmering between the 25th Infantry because of this and the community. Um, they, again, the newspaper said that Helen must have escaped his captors and hung himself over remorse, remorse for his deed. Um, the same day as the burial of Dr. Lynch at Bear Butte Cemetery, uh, officers of the 7th Cavalry caught an armed group of the 25th Infantry on their way into Sturgis to get even for the deed. And so General Sturgis ordered the entire outfit confined to base for three weeks. Now remember, we're in late August here, so mid-September they were allowed back out of their confinement a lot back into town. <clears throat> Corporal Helen himself was buried at Fort Meade in full military honors because he was never found guilty of anything. So they didn't see any reason not to take care of it that way. Oh, one quick thing. The same day the community found the lynched body of Corporal Helen hanging on Fiddler Street, an old friend wandered back into town. A baldy Ford decided to return. <clears throat> and I'm probably going to need to go over here in a couple minutes if you don't mind. Baldy Ford wandered back into town. He had already come back to Deadwood and got kicked out. Went to Central City, got kicked out. Went to Elizabethtown, got kicked out, and made his way back to Sturgis. Well, the uh, safety committee of the community decided this isn't a good time for him to be here. They were done with him. They had already strung up a couple people in the last year, and they were, the times had changed. They were not interested in Baldy Ford and his antics anymore. So they gave him $3 and a ride to Rapid City and uh, dropped him off there. Rapid City immediately ordered him to move on. And reports keep filtering back through the newspapers of him wandering down to Hermosa and Buffalo Gap and all these different places. And he ended up in the area of Shadron. And it was in about December of that year when a few miles west of Shadron along Cottonwood Creek, somebody found, buried in the sand, an ear and a hand sticking out. And they dug up what it was, and it was Baldy Ford's body. Uh, initially, people thought he might have just been drunk and froze to death there, and, but they weren't sure how he got buried. Um, then they did notice that there were unmistakable uh, marks of a rope on his neck. So somebody had caught up with Baldy Ford finally, and uh, he had met his, his end um, by, by way of a, a vigilante group. Um, you know, you could speculate maybe the people of Sturgis were worried because there was talk in the papers that he might be headed back this way. Who knows? Who knows? They might have had a third victim in the vigilante case. Um, anyhow, we did have uh, the simmering tension that was occurring in the community between um, the 25th Infantry and the local residents. Um, Time passed, about a month went by, and they were back, coming back into town, the 25th Infantry was, and still frequenting their favorite place. Abe Hills, go as you please go. One night, a uh, soldier by the name of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting names, but crazy today. Taylor, John Taylor, Private John Taylor, got kicked out. He was out of hand, and, and Abe Hill had him kicked out of the place. Well, he swore revenge. He went back to the fort. He got from 15 to 20 of his fellow members of Company H of the 25th Infantry. They fully armed themselves and in military fashion marched back into the town. They lined up here in Main Street in front of the building and they warned any soldiers that were in the building that they had to get out as fast as possible. And then in a military fashion, Private Taylor gave the order to fire and they fired volley after volley into the building. 
uh, just shooting, shooting it full of holes. And uh, had a little bit of fun there. Marched a couple buildings down uh, to Johnny Dolan's place, the Enterprise Club, and shot that up as well. And while they were shooting that one, they were yelling out to Deputy Sheriff Souter, who wasn't here, yelling, hey, meet us at Fiddler Street. Uh, we've got a surprise for you, that kind of thing. So there was definitely a tie to the animosity of this. It wasn't just about John Taylor getting drunk, getting kicked out of Abel's saloon, but they shot it up real bad. There was a young cowboy uh, sitting in the front window playing the banjo. Um, again, the names are escaping me. Um, Robert Bell, he was a young cowboy from Nebraska, he'd just come up here. He was sitting playing the banjo in the front window and watching some people play cards, and he got killed. Bullet, straight bullet went through a four inch post and right into his heart, killed him. So, um, again, there was a lot of tension in the community. People started arming themselves. Fort Meade went on lockdown. They, the 7th Cavalry heard the firing send troops in. <clears throat> the 25th Infantry, in the meantime, had come back from Dolan's place, fired on this building again, and then they scattered, and they went up over the hill back to Fort Meade, and were all back in their barracks by the time they were found. But they could kind of tell who had been out and about that night, whose weapons were, were still hot, and who had mud on their boots, and hiding in their bed, and that kind of thing. So they rounded up a big group of them. About five of them were ultimately charged with murder, um, a couple of them were ultimately sent to the penitentiary on a life term, uh, sentence of, of murder. The, the thing about the 25th Infantry is, after they left Sturgis, they had had a very peaceful run here. And the citizens of Sturgis, after this episode, asked General Terry to remove them from the community. They no longer wanted them here. And he said, hey, this is your fault. He said, they're, for the most part, have been peaceful. This is a small group of people that did this. And if you didn't allow this kind of thing to go on in your community, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about it. So he basically said they're not going anywhere. And it caused a lot of introspection in the community. And it was at that point that the city decided to organize as a town, to form a government, to take charge of their own destiny at that point. And it was when the things started settling down at that point. Uh, there were still a few more activities that occurred, but it was really the start of, of a lot of introspection and a lot of, of correction of, of some of the bad norms that were going on in the community. But um, what were the dates of that? The date of the shooting was October, or I mean, excuse me, September, I want to say 21st. Uh, 1885, sorry, 1885. Um, and that was uh, September 20th, 1885 is when that occurred. Um, following that, the 25th Infantry was taken out here in 1887. They had trouble in a couple other communities they went to in Montana, and I believe in Arizona. And in 1905, they ended up in Brownsville, Texas, and had some trouble, and a group of armed members of the 25th Infantry marched into Brownsville and shot up the town. And President Theodore Roosevelt dishonorably discharged the entire unit. And part of the testimony at the time was the episode that occurred in Sturgis 20 years earlier. Of course, we probably don't have the same soldiers there at all at that point. But they did dishonorably discharge the entire unit across the board. And that's kind of held up as one of the um, racial uh, things that um, Theodore Roosevelt has to deal with in his legacy because of this buffalo soldiers that were, were accused of this crime and unilaterally, you know, all discharged from the military because of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, anyhow, things started getting a little better in the community. Um, here we're still looking at, okay, but Abe Hill was still here. Johnny Dolan was still here. They both were still running these houses that horrible things were occurring at it virtually every night. Um, the city did ask the county commission to revoke their um, liquor licenses, and the Deadwood, the commissioners up in Deadwood, did, after, after this episode, revoke them temporarily. And then they decided, ah, they probably learned their lesson and gave their licenses back. So it was, um, it was in December of 1886 that Mr. G.J. Croft, who 
was a tenor for Winky and Company. Very respected citizen, uh, but he was at the exchange club and got drunk. And went home and found himself a couple of six shooters and some extra ammunition. And he decided to shoot up the town a little bit. He went up and down Main Street. He had painted himself in blackface and put on a large woman's hat for some reason. And he went up and down Main Street, um, entering different saloons and just firing his guns at, off at will. He was, it was out of like an old Western movie. He was making people dance by shooting at their feet. He was ordering people to pour in drinks. He was all kinds of things like that. But he, he, was, he was just shooting up the town. He hadn't shot at anybody at, to this point. But he got Dave Hill's place, went in, and was, again, ordering people to play cards with him and do different things, when out of the blue he turned and shot the bartender, Puck Patterson, in the chest. Um, that surprised everybody, and they scrambled, all dove and hid. He exited the building quickly, went down the street, firing at people up and down the street. A uh, young H.O. Anderson was one of the people that he fired at. And, uh, Made, a, made his way back around town again. And he, as he was going back up Main Street, he came back into Abe Hill's place. And by this time, they heard him coming. And so they had all armed themselves. And a shootout occurred. And he was firing away at various people in the building. And they were firing back. And it said that about 60 rounds of ammunition were exchanged during this whole evening. And he went down to Johnny, he exited and went down to Johnny Dolan's place, and at the point of the gun, one of the judges was in there, and he ordered him to pour him a drink. And while he was doing so, he realized that there were people waiting at the doors for him. So he turned and headed to the back door, and John Scholar was there waiting for him. He didn't cotton to any fool tomfoolery, and he knocked the guns out of his hand and apprehended him. And he was surprised he was able to apprehend him so easily, actually. And then they found out that at some point during this, they're not sure when, he had had a major artery in his leg clipped with a bullet. And he was bleeding out. And so they were able to staunch the blood. They sent him to Deadwood to put him in the jail. The Calaboose wasn't really that safe a place to put him in Sturgis. So they sent him to Deadwood to put him in the jail. And uh, he died of his injury while he was there. So, and that was when Sturgis really really decided this is it, we're done. They <clears throat> incorporated at that time. They withdrew the liquor licenses from the people that they felt were running the worst of the worst places. Uh, the county commission subsequently gave them their liquor licenses back and they relocated into that nebulous area between Sturgis and Fort Meade for the most part. Uh, which kind of brings us full circle back to you know, the beginning of the story. That was the bad area, and we had this pristine Main Street. It wasn't so pristine, and uh, there were a lot of reasons. 1887, it's, it's really kind of a pivotal year in the community. There was still a lot of violence, still a lot of things that occurred, uh, but nothing out of sorts with the other communities of the area. So that was when the railroad arrived as well, and the town really was really interested in cleaning up their reputation, cleaning up their act, because they wanted the railroad to come here and stay here. And this did end up being the end of the trail for a little while for the railroad, before they built Whitewood and went on to start their own town, a railroad town. So that takes us full circle. I had to skip a lot of stuff. There's many more murders, shootings, knifings, all kinds of stuff that occurred, but a lot of them weren't on Main Street, and a lot of them just wouldn't fit, because I went over by 10 minutes. So. I'd be glad to answer questions, otherwise I apologize for going long, and thank you very much for your attention.